this is boys and girls the service area of the Glover International Red Deer so you just pull in here and then you go and check in over there parts service you see and you give them the key and they take your truck and then you get to sit in this nice nice lounge check this out well, leather huge TV and this is that's why this video is called the surreal experience your own little washroom uh, but why it's called surreal experience I was just telling uh, the service coordinator Barry about this I said I said do you know that you know now they don't allow us to go inside anywhere right so I said for the past two weeks probably um, yeah, when I was on the way to Las Vegas, it was okay. Like, truck stops were open. Um, well, and they're open now, but back then, at least you can go. Okay, you see? Very important. Like, if you have a laptop, boom, you have a power outlet in there from the other side. See? Uh, and so, yeah, when I was driving to Las Vegas, uh, on the way there, I think I'll drop the anchor somewhere here because there's a power outlet and we're gonna start looking for loads mm -hmm. right next to this pretty lady and so the restaurants were open the sitting areas you know you can buy food and go sit down right but that changed when I got closer to Las Vegas and um, that's it. Everything is takeout. You have basically to go to a grocery store or or like Walmart to buy food. And then you're always in the truck. Yeah, these, see, this is because we're in Canada. So these are our popular free uh, magazines. Truck News and Today's Trucking. So you can find them at many uh, truck stops, at dealers. And actually, I used to write freelance for these guys like on their website you can even find some of my stories you know i was just writing uh kind of like you know how to stories how to save money on the road you know how to how to take care of your truck how how i went from a company driver to owner operator to owning my truck stuff like that so and so yeah so this is very surreal because I ask Barry, and he says, yeah, you can sit down here. I'm like, okay, because, you know, it's like prison. You know, you're always in your truck. You go in the morning, brush your teeth, you know, get uh, tea or coffee, and you're back in the truck. You, there's nowhere to sit, you know. So this is the new reality. And another funny thing is that the coordinator is wearing blue rubber gloves. And he says, yeah, you can park on the side. I'll take it from there. So I give him the key. He has a huge, <laughs> he has a huge sprayer thing. He just sprays the key and then puts it inside some paper, cleans it, and you know, like he cleans my key that I just gave him, right? Well, I return the favor. I use a piece of paper to open all the doors. You know, like I, they don't trust me. I don't trust them either, right? So, so this is pretty cool. So yeah, the truck is getting uh, oil change done. I told them uh, what specific fuel filters I need because quite often they give me wrong filters with too fine filtration and then they plug in very fast when you buy fuel in, in the States. And even here, like they don't, they, they don't fit this truck. I need specific, and I, I give them the model number of this pack half uh, filter water separator. And we're changing that, we're changing of course oil filter, the oil filter, and, we and I said I need a new air filter. That son of a bitch is like 100 bucks, you know, Canadian. But I've been seeing some restriction on the dash. I have air filter restriction gauge. And I definitely have been seeing uh, fuel restriction gauge because uh, this is the time I do oil changes every 25,000 miles or 40,000 kilometers. So now it's my truck has 190,000 kilometers only. That's all I did since, what, February 2018? When I got the truck? Yeah, I think 18. March, March 2018. So March 19, March 20. In two years, I did 190,000 kilometers, which is 100,000 miles is 160,000 kilometers. 30,000 
extra is what 20 so I did like 120,000 miles in two years so which is pretty good and it will help with the resale value okay now back to my laptop and now while they're working on the truck oh and they will grease uh, I didn't disconnect the trailer and turns out they have very big uh, pits uh, like you know the bays are super long so I don't even have to disconnect the the, the trailer that's what I love about these brand new you know uh, buildings and dealers right they all because everything gets bigger and heavier you know everything is huge over here there's a huge parking lot in the back and I don't even to disconnect the trailer they're gonna pull right in do oil change grease everything and I showed them I said okay he has a bunch of these grease nipples on the on the neck of the trailer you know on top where the cylinders are at the bottom I just make I just want to make sure they don't don't uh, miss them and I said uh, there's a couple on the spreader on the booster where the thing rotates you know with airbags and so uh, I made sure that they know that there's more points more nipples for greasing than than let's say you know what you find on a typical dry van trail so all right I don't want to turn on the TV because it's all bad news unless you watch a movie or something all right, and people are asking in comments to the last video, uh, do I still have the tr trouble with, uh, with the neck? And, um, and, uh, and, the, and the pin at the bottom. Now here's a picture, this was when my trailer was brand new. Well, almost. But this part, so this is the neck, right? And you see here, if you look at my, uh, like where I'm moving over here, so that's kind of like the bottom of the neck, but that's not connected to this. That's connected to those, um, you know, cambers, like right height things, right? And that's what this big bar is, um, is sitting on. So that bar was not a part of this. And so basically that's important. Uh, I just know why, why that happened, why the, this bar got stuck and why we couldn't do this we couldn't get that pin out of there so basically i had a timber in here that big timber was was um i i didn't uh, know where else to put it so after everything was loaded and i had rechained when i had to move the machine so i put this big timber in here like this across right and then i put the same chain 3 h chain over from this from this deering over here to there right and I started, you know, um, I started uh, tightening, tightening, tightening the chain. But as always, that chain with that particular binder, it's very twisty. It starts turning. So what you do is you put a crowbar in one of the, in the link on the binder. So that when you tighten, that link does not turn, right? And so what I did, because I wanted to use both hands, so like, let's say the binder was here. So I put one, the, the bent end of the crowbar I put in here. And then the sharp end was just sticking in the air a couple of inches away from the track of the machine because the machine was right here. And so I tighten it and when I was done and the chain was super, super tight, I realized I could not get the, <laughs> the crowbar out because the, the bent part was, you know hidden in here I just couldn't get it out I thought okay I'm not gonna undo it again I'll just leave it like that because the sharp end was a couple of inches away from the track you know and then on the next day uh, when I was checking all my chains it's either next day or same day but when I had to drive around the truck stop I think when that cop uh, kicked me out didn't like that I was blocking the car lanes over there uh, I checked and for some reason this was super tight if before before sorry before that crowbar was just sitting there but you know I left it like that because it couldn't go anywhere right it couldn't go forward because it was pushing into the neck it couldn't go back because the track was there and it was sitting at an angle so gravity and it wasn't in the way of anything and so I left it like that but and it was it was loose the crowbar was loose you know but now i go in there i put my hand on that crowbar and it's super super tight and i'm like what the heck why is it so tight i turn my head to look at the sharp end 
And to my horror, I see that the, now the sharp end is pushed into the track, or rather the track of this huge machine is pushing, in, and it's like a, a perfect angle, you know, to apply the so much weight. It's like 45 degree angle. And so the, the track, so the, the machine shifted just a tiny little bit. And uh, I think it was like some uneven at the truck stop there. It was some like this, you know, and of course it has this huge boom. And so it shifted just a tiny little bit and it started pushing into that crowbar, you know, and, um, and of course that's, that's what happened. So the crowbar, when it was pushing over here, so it twisted everything, right? It twisted the kingpin a little bit. It locked it kind of like, right? And it also it twisted the, the, um, oh yeah, I keep forgetting that I don't have a touch screen. <laughs> and it twisted these things over here. Uh, hold on, let me. Yeah, I see like these, right? Okay, yeah, so this bar, right? And that's this part, this part that has those, uh, you know, things where you change the height. So this part is directly, it's the same part where the crowbar was pushing, you know? And so when the so much weight pushed sideways, it, it somehow, you know, acted on this one. And so of course this one was on top, you know, that's how it affected this. So basically it moved it a little bit slightly out of adjustment, this one and the bottom kingpin. And that's what happened. And I was hoping that, and I was lying in bed thinking about this, like, and then I realized that's what happened. That's crowbar got pinched and it shifted the neck a tiny little bit and that's all it takes, you know? And so now um, everything is back to normal. This thing rotates, I don't know, at least from this position. Yeah, from 90 degrees, it rotates freely. The kingpin is loose. Everything is fine. It just, when you deal with so much weight, that what, that's what can happen. Well, I'm still working on my truck and there's a machine here and uh, no cups. I'm not sure if it has water or not, but I do want to drink coffee. I have my own tea. Uh, I want to stick more to like herbal tea, less caffeine. So I went back to Barry in service. I said, uh, is there any hot water anywhere? And he directed me to the parts department and they had the same machine and uh took me five minutes and uh i still couldn't figure out how to use it hold on yeah check this out the same machine was in the parts department and there was no real hot water for for making tea but they had this machine and you see now we only have lids for some reason no cups but anyway so they have these and they look like this with uh See with this thing right here, right? And I try like, okay, that's for water, right? Like where, <laughs> where do you put this? Like I saw these before and there was like a slit opening at the top and you put it in. And I was looking and looking, I could not see anything. So finally I went to the counter, the parts. I said, guys, I need some engineering advice. <laughs> I cannot figure out where to put this. And the guy says, well, just right in there. So just, you have to slide it like this. See, it stays like this. And then when you, when you push on this, there's a cover comes out and covers this. And then you just put it, you put a lid in here and then you press coffee and then you choose your size, which is probably one size. Like very weird looking machine, huh? Kind of like Canadian version. You know what it's called? Flavia, Flavia. So you know, like everywhere, right? They have this rental service. So somebody supplies this and brings them supplies. And then sooner or later, something is missing. There's either no cups or no, uh, no packs of coffee or something. And you see, sorry, drinks are not working. <laughs> <laughs> Drinks are not working. <laughs> so poor you, all you have is chocolate basically. Chocolate and nachos and stuff like that, which I'm not in the mood to do. Anyway, 
back to the drawing board. And they have some cool pictures over here. And you remember, right? I have, I, I am somewhat partial to uh, international trucks because that was my first ever truck. And actually this, uh, I was thinking about this one, you know, when I was looking at uh, Kenworth because I needed, I thought I needed this outside air cleaners. Uh, but yeah, the design is still old and ugly. I hate those lights. Um, don't like them, but they came up with this. I think it's, it was called Paystar. Kind of like, same as mine international, but it, it had an option of uh, air cleaners. Actually, wait a second. No, they, they did change the front. Now it looks different. It's it's just, it's a very old uh, old picture. But you see, the guy ha here has uh, heavy hauling something with four axles in the back. And uh, tandem drives, but very tiny little steer axle. It's probably like this one. You can see that it's very small, just single tire. Kind of like here. So probably just 13,000 pounds. That's what some cheap guys do. When they cannot afford the, a real pusher axle. Like mine is 20,000 pounds. So. Yeah, it's almost already noon. And the, I don't see these guys are very busy, but yeah, I, I, I like this. It's kind of like, uh, I always saw this kind of setup in a, you know, like a Chrysler or, you know, Ford dealer, right? When you just come in your car and it's right there, but these guys made it for trucks, right? So it's pretty long. Of course, I cannot come in here with a trailer, but with a truck, it's, you know, it's nice. They gets you out of the, of the bad weather, right? So anyway, so one load. No, I saw two loads, but one guy wants me to go to Florida from Guelph, which is five days away, Guelph, Ontario. He has a load to go to Florida for three bucks a mile. I said, no, thank you, but no, thank you. And then there's a load from uh, Calgary, I think, to Tacoma, Washington. But, you know, once you say the word Washington, you realize how many sick people are there, you know? And that's what I'm thinking now also about, you know, when I look at the destination, I'm thinking, okay, do I really want to go there? I don't have any masks. Or I have two pairs of uh, real gloves, you know, those uh, disposable gloves, but you're supposed to throw them away, you know, those super thin blue gloves. I found them in my... Uh, kit, uh, you know, that emergency kit in the truck. And so, yeah, you want to be, you want to be careful, right? I don't want to talk to people. I want to be in the truck and uh, a long trip somewhere actually would be nice. You know, I'd love to go to Texas somewhere and you know, just stay away, stay away from uh, everybody, you know, be, stay in your truck, maybe go take a shower or something, but I definitely, I don't, I don't want to be somewhere in a busy busy area like you know Seattle Washington or Tacoma Washington or New York City where something like that so it's kind of scary you know scary times well it's uh, 1 25 p.m. right now I'm still here I'm not sure what it takes why it takes seven hours to change oil uh, air filter uh, oil filter and two fuel filters and grease a rig which is only 85 feet long <laughs> so I went in twice to ask him like is there are you guys waiting for parts or something no he says you have like three trailers in there right like the boost of the Jeep he says it's taking some time and I said well I hope you guys are not gonna charge me for uh, you know seven hours of labor uh, and in another news, I did receive a call from uh, Gene Core, from the president himself. And he, he also did not, he did not agree with my request to get the engineer fired and said that's not how they, uh, they do things. Uh, so they offered me a discount on well, the last payment I owe them for the Stinger. Uh, I know some people uh, would not take that. Some people would take them to court or refund the money, but I don't have time for this. I gotta move on, you know. 
the most important thing is I, I had the shims made, I don't care. I paid the money so they, they will reimburse me for what I paid and give me a you know a discount. Uh, but we're gonna move on and next time maybe use uh, genuine fontaine parts. But for now I already have everything I need. I need I have the Jeep, this the stinger, the spreader. So as long as these shims I just made and they look quality shims, um I'm happy. So basically, I'm moving on. But uh, an interesting thing is uh, that uh, another YouTube fan from Ontario who does a heavy haul and who gave me advice on uh, on shims when I thought that the spreader was totally, you know, wrong. He says, "Oh, all you need is shims," and he sent me this picture. Just take a careful look at the photo where you see it's the same design and you will see that at the top there's no pins. There's no pins, they just have like a kind of like a magazine on each side, you know, like a receptacle with a bolt where you put the shims. So that's what I needed. I needed something like that, but unfortunately, yeah, on my trailer I have those eyes, right? So. But uh, I guess they could have uh, kept the end of their spreader level and, you know, with no eyes and just, you know, build something on the top of the back, on the back of my trailer where I could put shims in. But instead they built me a, an unshimmable model. Now compare that with what I got. Here's my photo. You will see a huge gap. Uh, between my trailer and the spreader and they put pins at the top which have round holes round not oval and so they're not shimmable in the in the way they are designed now that's why I had to modify that and pay five hundred eighty three dollars Canadian to the welding shop and the last picture of the day I'm gonna show you when I was talking in the when I was talking at the beginning of this video about what caused the twisting motion on the neck and why the kingpin one the why i could not remove the pin at the bottom and why it became so hard to move that uh, height a right height selector handle so this is the photo that shows how the um, that bar the crowbar was pushed in into the bottom side like on the passenger side of the neck all right well that's all i have for now so hopefully uh, my truck will be ready soon and i found a small motel away from everybody uh, didn't didn't book a load uh, so far and it's already lunch time here so i don't think i'll find anything but if i do i will still book it for monday loading i'm not going to load today so i found a small hotel the guy is giving me a good price and the most important thing there's a lot of parking so i don't have to disconnect the truck and trailer so I'm checking in, going into self-isolation until Monday. I'm gonna watch TV and uh, binge watch some Netflix. And it'll be back to the load board, drawing board, so to speak, on Monday. And that's it. I give up. I surrender into a hotel. Voluntary surrender. Uh, the hotel didn't have enough parking Like it has parking, but how do you get in there? You know like to the, the turn to shop, but he said hey, there's a there's a petrol in here And he says our guests sometimes park their trucks over there And so I called these guys and they said it's fine And I left on my business card. I said call me if there's any issues and they said the only issue can be when they have deliveries on um, like a, there's a double tanker and he has to, you know, go wide like this and come to the pumps. And I said, well, I'm pretty far and I'm right next to the curb. Uh, and uh, I got some food. So, and I said, give me a room where nobody stayed for at least, for at least uh, 14 days. 
And I forgot to bring my sanitizer, but now I'm gonna grab a towel and uh, you know wet it with uh, some soap, and I'm gonna clean up everything, all surfaces, just to be on the safe side. So the room was 70 bucks Canadian, which is uh, right now at the at the exchange rate of 1.4. It's like you know, 50 bucks. It's pretty decent. It's one of those small chains, so no breakfast anymore. So the, the TV is pretty good. Mm, I guess that's the bathroom, a royal size, <laughs> pretty tiny. Uh, oh, and the last thing, the last thing I want to say is about the um, the oil change. I never in my life paid so much for oil change in Greece. Okay, it's a big trailer, right? We have a trailer. We have a Jeep and we have the Stinger. And they all have these grease nipples, as they call them, right? So, Glover trucks. So, do not use if you're in a rush. Okay, I appreciate the fact that they put me in, like I called them on the day before, and they said, yeah, bring it 7 o'clock. You know, Alberta can be crazy busy, right? And I showed up at 7. The truck was in probably around 7.30. And at least I was sitting in the driver's lounge from 7.30 to 1.30. No food, just had one coffee and um, one tea. And I was afraid to go, you know, anywhere. I was just sitting there playing with my computer trying to find a load. So I took it from 7.30 to 1.30 to change oil, change air filter, change uh, the, uh, the oil filter and two uh, fuel filters and grease everything. And finally it's ready. I go, I go there. And the guy shows me the bill, it's 1100 Canadian dollars. 1100 US. I know you guys are probably laughing at my expense right now. So that's about uh, more than 700 US. And I ask him, are you, are you like, guys, uh, like everything is fine, like with your health, you know, especially with your mental health? No, of course, I did not say that, but I said, why is it so much? And so. They charge, of course, all dealers. That's why I never like doing this at a dealer because they charge by the hour for greasing. Whereas if you go to a truck stop in the States, it's much cheaper. But I wanted to do it. I knew it would be expensive, but I didn't expect 1100 bucks. I thought it would be somewhere around five, six, maybe $700. Probably that's what I paid once at Kenworth. It was about 700 And they gave me regular oil, 15W40, but it's already warm, so that's fine. But they did change everything. Everything is cool. Just a bit pricey, you know, but I will get a hundred bucks uh, back as a HST sales tax. And the guy, when I pay, the guy gives me the key. He says, okay, sir, your truck is outside. I go outside. I, everything looks good. I see grease everywhere. You know, I start the truck, check engine light comes on and doesn't go away. And I'm like, I did not have this when I, when I drove in. I have 190,000 kilometers on this, on the odometer. It's pretty much a new truck. I go in and I say, guys, I did not have this. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's somehow related to your to your seven hour long activities over here. And um, I said, maybe you, you forgot to hook up a sensor. You know, sometimes they do that. Uh, happened to me quite a few times. They forgot to hook up a wire or a sensor. Once at TA, when I had my international, the guy says, no, that's fine. So no, that's not fine. And it turns out he broke something. I had to wait three days for that piece because it was a TA, they don't have any access like 24 seven to parts. And so this guy comes out with a laptop, uh, hooks up, he reads the code, it's a uh, low fuel injector pressure. Basically he says it can be your failing fuel pump. I'm like, what? <laughs> Nothing is failing, sir. Just could you please print me out this code? And he goes back, he prints out and he says, actually, when I print it out, the interpretation is it's uh, kind of like temporary um, low, low fuel pressure during cranking. He says the result can be uh, extended cranking when you try to start the engine, but the engine started fine. And he says, I'll try to clear the code. Maybe it was just the air. The air got in the system when he was changing filters. He probably didn't bleed it properly. I don't know. Anyway, so he goes back, grabs another laptop where he has this software to clear the codes. And, uh, Takes him 10 minutes to finally get into the system because he needs permission from comments from, you know, it's not as simple because it's an international dealer. But finally he's in, 
he clears the codes. I said, and he said, okay, done. I said, wait, can we at least try, you know, to see if there's the code or not? And he turns the key, starts the engine, five seconds, the code is gone. I mean, the, the check engine light is gone, like usual. And I breathe a sign of relief because 10 days ago, my warranty expired on the engine. I have no warranty. So this was good news, but Glover trucks, $1,100 for oil change and grease is excessive. Thanks for watching.